Let us take you back to 1939, to a small town near the border between Belgium and Holland. Hidden between its forests, along the banks of the Albert Canal, grey bunkers and impressive guns form stark lines against the morning dawn. This is the location of Belgium's biggest and most strategic fortress, the Fortress of eben -Emau. As Hitler invades Poland in September 1939, Belgium and France become aware of the threat of imminent invasion. The French fortify their borders with Germany with a line of military installations known as the Maginot Line. Belgium, neutral in the war at that time, also identifies the threat of a German attack. Blocked by the heavy defenses near the border of France, the Germans would move through Belgium in order to attack their French enemy, as they did in the First World War. To fend off this attack, the fortress of Eben Emau was built. In its superb strategic location and heavily armed, it could destroy the three key bridges along the Albert Canal. Bridges who would be essential to the German army should they want to invade the country. Armed with heavy artillery and machine guns in over 17 bunkers and gunning emplacements, the fortress could rain down deadly fire on any military force that would even come close. Defended by the Albert Canal and its 50 meter high cliffs, the entire facility was built underground inside a mountain. With anti-tank ditches and bunkers on the lower levels, an entire facility inside the rock and powerful gunning turrets on top of the plateau interconnected via tunnels, it was deemed impenetrable. Today, we take you inside this impressive military installation and tell you the tale of the Battle of Eben Emau. Welcome to the very edge of real and cyberspace. We are inside an enormous underground fortress, one of the biggest, if not uh, the impenetrable fortress of Eben Imal. Thanks to the power of the internet and our guide, we've gotten an exclusive tour in one of Belgium's biggest underground fortresses, which was uh, deemed impenetrable, unconquerable uh, back in 1938, until the Germans came. We are going to take a tour in this uh, spectacular facility, under the ground, deep um, inside the mountains of Eben Emal, and uh, on the border of the Dutch and German countries. With us is our guide, Bart, and uh, he is going to show us around this complex. Uh, we're going to talk about what it is, where it is, why it was built, and what happened to it during the Second World War. Um, we have had the honor and the pleasure of being here completely alone. There are no people here. We've gotten an exclusive tour. That makes me a very, very happy podcaster, and uh, we hope that you'll enjoy this little episode. So Bart, where are we? Well, basically we are uh, traveling between the underground barracks level and the intermediate level. We are using uh, the small staircase, which has approximately 62 steps. And you can hear, probably hear by the podcaster's voice that, uh, well, he has a bit trouble getting up these uh, steep hills. Uh, he's kind of exhausted. Now, of course, I am uh, a bit used to climbing these uh, steps. So that's why my breath is pretty much okay. So I've got it under control. I'm panting exotically uh, because it is an enormously big complex. The fortress of Eben Imal. For those of us uh, who don't actually know what or where it is, what is the fortress of Eben Imal and, and why, was, why and when was it built? Well, the fortress of Eben Imal was built in the 1930s, to be more specific from 1932 to the end of 1935. 
So basically three years, and then we had this uh, massive giant complex right underneath the ground. Now, this fortress was indeed, as you uh, said, claimed to be impenetrable, and it was built here to defend, uh, for one reason, the region of Eben Emal. More specific, three bridges across the Albert Canal in the north uh, section of the fortress, and then we we're talking about the bridges of Kan, Vroenhoven, and Veldwezelt. Now, why these three bridges were extremely important, I'll come back to that later, but all in all, the fortress was built to protect, among other things, those three key bridges. Now, to do so, we had a lot of artillery on top of the fortress, and basically you can compare the fortress to a large battleship. That means that the defensive bunkers are uh, basically around the fortress, while the artillery, the offensive weaponry, is right on top of the fortress, and they had the capability to fire uh, on each of those three bridges, therefore defending or uh, de destroying those three bridges. And those three bridges were of uh, very important tactical uh, importance because they are, um, geor uh, geor as speaking of geography, the Albert Canal actually separates Belgium and Holland, and Holland is adjacent to Germany, and we were talking 1938, the rise of Hitler and the threat of German invasion. Is that why the fortress was built here, or um, did it have other reasons to defend Belgium in general? Well, it had two reasons, uh, one being the, uh, the reason you mentioned uh, before. The second reason was actually because the Germans uh, actually invaded Belgium right here in the First World War and near this region. So in order to prevent the Germans from doing that all over again, we actually built uh, this fortress. Now, indeed, the Albert Canal uh, runs uh, from Liège to Antwerp near the Dutch-Belgian border. And the main problem for this region, it's fairly hillside, and the Albert Canal actually is um, dug right through a lot of the countryside, leaving large uh, gaps on each side. So we have uh, steep ridges on either side of the Albert Canal, and especially near the bridges of Groenhoven and Veldwezelt, there the, bridge, uh, the bridges lie fairly high above the water level. So when these bridges were destroyed by either the fortress or infantry units uh, right next to the, uh, to, to the bridges, then the Germans would have a great uh, deal of pain in order to cross the Albert Canal because of the height difference between the Albert Canal and the road level. So it was vital for them to actually cover those three or protect those three bridges. And of course, for Eben Emal, it was the task to actually destroy those bridges at all costs. So if the Germans came and invaded Belgium, they needed, of course, to bring a lot of tanks and artillery and personnel. And if you look at the countryside, we'll post some pictures up in the show notes, it is a little bit like uh, Calais and Dover. Both uh, sides of the water have uh, very big uh, ridges, but very big uh, cliffs, which go up to, I think, at some places, 30 or 40 meters. 50 meters, actually. 50 meters. And if you are going to cross a river and you're at the riverbank and it is flat, you can take an emergency bridge, just throw it in the water and drive your tra tanks across. But of course, if there's a wall of 30 to 50 meters of rock on either side, it's not that easy. So destroying those bridges would have stopped or delayed the German invasion uh, very much. Yeah, indeed, that's correct. Uh, in fact, it was even so that the fortress of Eben Emel should resist for at least five days in order for the French and the British army to actually advance into Belgian countryside and form a defensive perimeter. So five days, that is actually the amount of time we had to stall the enemy. But unfortunately, uh, as we are going to discuss later on during this podcast, unfortunately, the Germans decided otherwise. So we're, taking a, so we're walking through this massive underground complex, which was uh, very heavily armed, strategically very important, and uh, we're going to take a look at how it's built. at the, uh, what, could, what could be considered the bridge of, uh, of the fortress of Ibn Imal, the command center. If you walk inside, uh, they have created uh, some beautiful replicas 
of how it actually looked. You will see a switchboard. You'll see a mapping table. It's all very classic. If we, if we take a look at how we communicate during these modern days, it is almost another world. And uh, Bot's going to show us and tell us what uh, the command center actually was for and how it was, uh, in the, how it was involved in the invasion. Okay, so right now we are at the command center of the fortress, which is actually six different rooms, all interconnected uh, with each other. And they house basically every vital part of the information flow going in and going out of the fortress. On the one uh, side of the gallery, of the main gallery, we have three fire control rooms, which actually coordinate and calculate the coordinates for uh, opening fire on the enemy. So basically how it works, we have on top and around the fortress several uh, outside observation posts, because obviously being 30 meters under the surface, we have no direct sight uh, of the outside. They will spot the enemy, communicate their information through to the command post, and uh, more importantly, the uh, fire control rooms. This is where the coordinates will be calculated. They have uh, tables and drafts. They pretty much have all the work uh, done uh, for on forehand. Um, so basically they calculate the coordinates, they send it through by telephone to one of the bunkers, uh, which will respond with an artillery shell. One artillery shell for the observer to actually uh, spot, make some corrections if necessary, and when everything is, uh, when it was a hit, uh, let me put it that way, when it was a hit, then the order was given to fire. Um, continuously until the enemy was destroyed. So basically, let's say they spotted a German tank near near one of the bridges, they would um, call the command room, say like, okay, they're at bridge number A, I don't know, and the command room would actually uh, notify the uh, gunning turret, which had the coordinates as elevation pitch yawn, basically cannon move left that many centimeters, move up in that angle and fire and it will get there. So one shot to see if they would, you know, be uh, on the money and then they would start firing away. Yeah, correct. Unless, uh, of course, they had, uh, we had some numerous uh, important uh, key points such as bridges, uh, important crossroads, uh, junctions and all that, uh, of which we already had the coordinates. So in case uh, the Germans would be at one of those strategic points, you can skip pretty much all of this. There was no immediate uh, recalculation of the coordinates because they already had them, so they could open fire pretty uh, pretty quick. Now, um, so some of these sites were actually, you know, by, kind of like bookmarked by by the gunners, like this bridge, that bookmark, fire. Yeah, indeed. This is basically the story for uh, the uh, fire control rooms. On the other hand uh, of the gallery, you have the office of the commander of the fortress in wartime. So in peacetime, he had his uh, office in the underground barracks. In wartime, he had his barracks or his um, desk over here. So log and everything was managed uh, over here. Then we have uh, in the center the radio room for communication towards the outside world. And finally, we have the transmission room for all the communication internally. So basically what that means is that inside the fortress you had pretty much no direct communication apart from some hardwired lines for the observation. But everywhere else, if you just picked up the phone, the guy you were talking to was the guy in the... Um, in the Communications room. In the communications room, correct, and uh, he would put you through to the correct uh, person who you, who you wanted to talk to. So basically, no direct communication. So it was like like uh, having to send a, 
I don't know, an email and, and the guy at the switchboard would be the mail server actually taking your, your message and going out. What kind of communications are we talking about to the outside world? I mean, inside it's all copper and phone lines. Radio was that, uh, could you, satellites were out, uh, not, not at that time yet, but basically they just had a radio communication to other strategic fortresses or, or was it otherwise? Yeah, they had uh, three main uh, radio wires. In fact, one of them is actually right above your head. This is the horizontal antenna, which actually had a range of 30 kilometers, uh, which would be enough to reach the command post in uh, the headquarters of the fortification belt in, of Liège, in Liège uh, itself. Then we had a vertical antenna, which actually came out right on top of the roof of the fortress. And the third antenna was um, communications for the Belgian Air Force, or in fact, the Allied Air Force, that is. Unfortunately, most of the lines that came uh, to the outside were immediately destroyed by the Germans due to bombardings. However, this line over here, uh, the 30 kilometer range line, that was intact uh, throughout the entire war. So the antenna was actually on the inside of the fortress. Uh, you can see it, it's a, it's a large, uh, it's, a, it's a thin metal cable running along the entire length of, of the corridors to, to serve as an antenna to the outside. Yeah, that's true. So um, by changing uh, a small metal piece over here, we could actually adjust the frequency and therefore um, continue even further uh, with our broadcasts. Now, unfortunately, this was basically the only uh, communication to the outside world we had left because all of the lines which connected the fortress to the nearby infantry units, those uh, telephone cables, unfortunately, were not yet dug in. Uh, so they were actually external lines, which, uh, needless to say, were bombed instantly and, well, basically, we had no communication left with the outside, apart from the uh, large antenna. To give us a better look at the awesome power the Fortress of Ebene Mal boasted, Bot decided it was time to give us a closer look at one of the casemates. Casemate VZ2. We took a closer look at this enormous gun reemplacement, how it worked, and how they let technology work for them back in the day. So we're going up to through one of the main, uh, one of the the many many tunnels down here. And as you can hear by us panting, this isn't flat, people. What is the uh, total difference of height between the top of the plateau, where the uh, gun turrets are actually on the exterior, and uh, the bottom, which seems, <laughs> which seems a, a long way down if I look down, because it's, uh, it's a steep incline. How high is the fortress actually, and how wide? Well, basically, um, first, the height, we have 50 meters from uh, the extreme top to the extreme bottom of the fortress, or the entrance level of the fortress. And that's how, uh, basically, the fortress is divided. So at minus 50 uh, meters under the surface, you have the level of the underground barracks. Then if you go 20 meters up, you're coming into the intermediate level system. That's where we are right now. And then if you go an additional 30 meters up, then approximately you will reach the bunker level of the fortress where the artillery domes, etc., are. Now, in terms of length, we have, um, actually the fortress is like a giant triangular shaped fortress with a base of 700 and a height of approximately 900 meters. This results in a 45 uh, hectares area, let's say within the triangle, but if you take everything that's military terrain around it into account, then we have approximately 75 hectares, which is approximately 150 soccer pitches uh, long or wide, so big. So to give you a general impression, that's how big we are. And uh, these corridors had to be traversed on foot. Well, that's correct. Unlike the Maginot Line, for example, in France, uh, we did not have trains or anything for the men to move around. In fact, uh, if you were a regular soldier, you always had to go on foot. If you were an officer, depending on your duty, of course, or uh, someone from the medic personnel, you had bikes at your disposal. But for the regular men, it's, um, it's by foot. I'm, I'm looking down the, the, the slope of this corridor and I'm imagining careening down here on a bike downward and having to stop at a T-section at the bottom in order not to slam into a concrete wall. That is pretty scary, but I think the, the thing that's also scary is having to go uphill 
I don't think a bike is a present there uh, either. No, uh, and the bike is the least of your concern. If you were a soldier and you were working in one of the casemates or the artillery bunkers, you need to uh, pull two lorries of water, uh, coolant water, up to the bunkers, and you, we actually walked past it when we climbed the steps. That's where they needed to fill up. And, well, of course, going up a hill with uh, those lorries, to give an idea, approximately 250 kilos when they were filled with water, it was quite a weight. And uh, to, be fr uh, to be frank, that's not really my job to, well, it wouldn't, I wouldn't like to have that job going up uh, with those lorries over here. Imagining just, you know, pulling, just walking up here is pretty exhausting. All the, the three of us are panting. Uh, imagine pulling 250 liters of water behind you upwards and then having to uh, traverse some stairs and God knows what to get to work is one, one hell of a commute. So we're underneath uh, casemate vc which was an artillery post up top uh, of the bunker, which was not attacked during the initial attack. And uh, as a result of that, it is completely intact uh, because it was not attacked. Um, we, are t we are looking at the intact version of uh, two gigantic steel doors with uh, sandbags and everything in the middle, protecting or basically dividing the exterior of the uh, tunnel that leads up to the uh, casemate of the inside of the fortress. Why such precautions? It looks like an airlock. Well, it basically is an airlock. Um, first of all, why did we need so much protection? Well, it goes back from the First World War, we, which we actually learned lessons from. Uh, if you look up some history about uh, Belgium in the First World War, more specifically the defensive perimeter around Liège with the ancient forts of Liège, there one fortress had the bad luck of having an impact uh, on the central ammunition depot of uh, that fortress, resulting in the complete implosion, uh, as if, of that fortress. It's the fortress of Lancet, you can uh, look that up. Now, to, in order to protect uh, the newer fortresses even better, every bunker received its own ammunition depot, therefore separating uh, all the ammunition, therefore rendering it a bit safer. Now this brings us to the airlock doors right here at the bottom of the stairwell. Uh, as you already said, it consists of an, a number of steel doors, steel beams, and then to cover everything up, uh, sandbags. Now why this heavy? Well, because the Belgians realized that if something would have happened on top or inside the, the gunnery rooms of this casemate and the enemy would have some entrance to the inside, then this was really the last line of defense of the fortress on the inside. So basically what they then did, when they retreated, uh, the last Belgian soldier would close the door on the inside of the airlock, then would uh, place 30 steel beams from top to bottom, fill up the remaining gap with a number of sandbags, and then he would close the armor door on the inside. Therefore, uh, when this everything was done, we could tell that the Belgian soldiers would never go back up. This was really the last line of defense. It's basically building a, I think the, the airlock as we, we uh, described it is about two meters between the two steel doors and that would be filled up with steel beams, sandbags, basically making a, a wall, walling up the inside of the fortress to the outside of the fortress. Correct. And uh, it is even so that if you had uh, time left, you could actually uh, unscrew the handlebars of the doors so that when closed, you couldn't open them again from the German side, let's, uh, let's call it that way. But not only an, 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 a protection against invasion, also a protection against uh, an incident or, or, or a calamity inside one of the turrets, for example, a shell going, going bad, setting off the um, ammunition that was inside the turret. So when these uh, turrets were in operations, these doors were closed. Well, not really, because uh, these were opened pretty much all of the time because the ammunition lorries had to pass uh, from the ammunition depots behind the doors right through them towards the ammunition elevators. Now, you could say, well, it's an airlock, so they would open and close them, but they, did, they really didn't have the time uh, in 1940 because of uh, this attack. Now, 
although this casemate was not attacked by the Germans using shaped charges and all that, uh, the crew of this bunker actually heard the news of the Maastricht casemates, which were attacked. So they were quite scared and they were like, well, we need to continuously open fire in order to prevent the Germans from attacking us. So basically what we have is that these casemates fired, well, pretty much constantly on targets uh, such as uh, pontoon bridges near the south section of the fortress. This is like um, a before and after shot. I'm uh, looking at uh, the stairwell and the uh, ammunition elevators that are heading up to this casemate that was not um, uh, attacked by the Germans and that was not destroyed using a hollow charge. It's a, it's a beautiful construction. It's a little bit tainted with rust, but I think we'll be safe going up. Um, and um, we will go up to uh, the casemate Visé Tué. This, this staircase to an apartment building. Where, where, how many floors are we looking at? Well, uh, if you take approximately two and a half meters per floor, we're going up into the air approximately 25 meters. Uh, my math really is no good, so uh, I'll leave the calculations to you. So basically, we're just we're, we're going up a 10-story building. No, that'll be 12. How many meters? Uh, 25. Yeah, 10-story building. <laughs> And uh, Niana, who's afraid of heights, is having the time of her life here. <laughs> and on these horizontal parts, these are actually steel plates that you can flip up and... and <laughs> Okay, we are uh, in the basement uh, area, if we can call it that way. We just, uh, this is the first time I've actually gone up 10 flights of stairs to come out in the basement, uh, which is illogical but true, of Casamat uh, Visé Tué. This is a, a mini installation, so to speak. Um, what, what was the, the casemate used for? What was it firing? And, and why, why all these facilities? Well, the casemate was firing uh, 75 millimeter shells uh, by its three guns, so three 75 millimeter guns. Now, in order to actually um, have a smooth operation, the empty casings you had when firing the guns had to be thrown somewhere. So that's where the basement actually comes in, because over here we have three empty casing rooms in where the shells uh, fell from the uh, ceiling. Now, in order to, uh, you can see all gas-proof doors over here, and this had a reason. The reason is the ventilator right here in the corner, because the ventilator actually made sure that there was overpressure in the gun room of the uh, casemate. Now, why overpressure, or what is overpressure, basically? Well, basically, it means that there is more air on the inside of the casemate than there is around uh, on the outside or in the basement area. This has a very positive thing when firing these guns, because when you have overpressure, the fumes the toxic fumes that uh, come from uh, firing are actually uh, forced through the barrel towards the outside. So basically, in theory, these men could work without a gas mask uh, during regular uh, times. Now, this intermediate level also housed some reposing benches in wood next to the wall for the men to actually relax a bit in between uh, fire emissions. We also have a toilet, which is uh, unique. And I'll come back to the toilet uh, with some rather nasty twists and turns uh, at the end of our story near the Maastricht 1 uh, casemate. So basically, this wraps up the intermediate level. And uh, it's time for us to head towards the uh, second level uh, of this casemate, the actual fire level, so where the guns are. One more last 
last detail here at the uh, basement of the casemate VZ2 is the uh, internal ammunition elevator. So we had the two main uh, ammunition elevators uh, right where right next to it we had the stairs we had to climb to get here. So, so the ammunition would be supplied at the bottom of the uh, fortress, come up through internal serv uh, uh, through internal uh, elevators, ammunition elevators, then to this 10-story climb towards uh, the basement of the casemate, and then it would go up even one more level. Yeah, indeed. This uh, detour uh, was necessary for the overpressure to maintain to be maintained because. Uh, right uh, one uh, story up, we have another airlock for the men. However, as we will see, the doors are, well, misplaced as if. And if you would uh, use or if you would want to pull an ammunition lorry through uh, all the way on the top hand level, then both doors of the airlock had to be opened at the same time, therefore losing overpressure. That's why the ammunition elevators actually came to a more or less complete stop at the basement level, the ammunition lorries were taken out and sent to the, uh, to the interior ammunition elevator of this uh, specific casemate over here, which is, as you can see, basically just a cage in which one lorry was placed, but as you can see, with airtight doors. Uh, this is, this is a real case of an airlock because the uh, upper half of the casemate was in a heightened, sen heightened state of air pressure and this would be uh, necessary to allow. Now, I, I, I can, th these were live shells, right? You would like start at the bottom of the, uh, of the fortress, wheel this little cart around with how many? Uh, 42. 42 shells. 42 live shells, okay, hobble them up. Uh, cram them into one of these iron elevators, shoot that elevator up about 10 flights of uh, stairs, haul it out across the concrete floor into an... and these are all live shells. And if one of them went off, there's nowhere for the explosion to go here, is there? No, but the shells weren't exactly live yet. Uh, again, for safety precautions, we had the shells themselves who were stored in wooden crates uh, in the ammunition depots which were then loaded into the iron carts sent up. But with the cart, we also sent a large wooden case with detonators on them. And it was even so that the detonating, uh, the blasting caps weren't um, installed yet on the shell. So basically the shell itself was pretty harmless, okay? It contained explosives, but as yeah. long as you didn't touch it, nothing happens. It is up until the moment that the shells go into the gun, so when they are loaded actually, right before then the blasting caps are installed and the detonators. In fact, it is even so that the detonator is only armed uh, right or right prior for uh, opening fire, so prior from loading the gun itself. Okay, so the ammunition would only be hot when it was literally in the barrel of the gun. Well, right before uh, and of course when it was in the barrel of the gun as well. Yeah. So we're in the casemate of the uh, VZ, which we're visiting in detail, and it's it's amazing. It's being like inside a giant, um, basically iron shed, because the walls are lined with uh, with with iron uh, boards, and in front of me are three gigantic guns. Now I have seen this casemate on the outside, and I know that this place is actually. Uh, sticking out uh, about f 50 meters, 40 meters above the Albert Canal on the, the exterior of the fortress uh, is surrounded by a lot of concrete and I'm standing in front of a very, very impressive uh, piece of artillery with a copper band at the top uh, noting at what angle the, uh, the gun is actually pointing left or right and there's another dial at the right that uh, is... Um, for the elevation of the gun, so basically by looking at these um, these markings, you could say, okay, the gun's pointing so many degrees left or right, and so many degrees up or down, and these were basically the coordinates. Now, if I take a look at this, I don't see the outside. There are no windows, There, there's no door, there is not even a, a, this, a peeking hole. So you, oh, there, is a little, oh, there is a little peeking hole. There used to be a little peeking hole, but basically you're, you're, you're standing here 
and you don't know, you, do, you absolutely do not know what's going on, where you're firing, if you're hit it, or anything. That's uh, quite in fact correct, because right here, uh, we are standing in, in the gun room, and as you told uh, the listeners, the, there are a number of uh, locations or a number of places here where you can actually see the elevation of the gun. Now, this information, so the coordinates, came from the command room we visited earlier, and we actually relied on those coordinates because. Uh, Let's tell the truth. Coordinates are way more uh, precise than just telling, well, we need to hit the crossroad right over there in Riemst. That wouldn't make any sense. So coordinates are very, very accurate. And because this is long distance artillery up to 11 kilometers of range, this is not the case over here, but there are cases in which it is also told that the soldiers were unaware of the targets they were firing at because there was local recruition. So the men of the fortress came 90% uh, from the immediate surroundings of the fortress or from the nearby villages. And it would, of course, be a bit dull for them to shoot upon their own house, so to speak. So Because the Germans were there. For example, the Germans invaded their hometown and they would get the firing order, okay, wipe out, I don't know, Veldweiselt or something. Yeah, true. But if you were from Veldweiselt and you were given the order to shoot upon Veldweiselt, I could say that you were a bit reluctant to pull the trigger. So instead of saying Veldweiselt, we just said, well, fire at coordinates X, Y, Z. And well, that way you won't give away the name of the village, for example, you are going to hit. So again, for them to be a bit in the dark about what they were shooting at, but for their own good. Because this is one of the funny things about the fortress of Ibn Mal. It's not actually firing at a foreign country. It's firing at, uh, at bridges in your own country and, it, and was uh, built to fire at locations inside Belgium should the, should the um, Germans cross the border. So it's, it's actually a case of, well, friendly fire is a big word to keep out uh, the Germans. It is, uh, this is not line of sight artillery. So if you're thinking, I've got a gun, I'll aim and I'll shoot you don't see your target and your shell is actually not going in a straight line, it's going in a wide arc. And that is why the coordinate system uh, needed, to be, needed to be done. And this was before Google Maps, before GPS, this was all done uh, hand, uh, using by hand. The most, in, the most advanced piece of uh, technology, communication-wise, is the telephone line here and, and, and the radio, and that was basically all they had. Yeah, true. We had no like radar things. Didn't exist, or it might have existed, but certainly not here at Ibn Imal. So basically, telephone lines and observation posts on the outside is basically what we consider our eyes to the outside world. And unfortunately, when the Germans landed on top of the fortress, they were well aware of two important targets. One being every single artillery piece that could fire upon the bridges. Uh, and the second thing was actually every observation post on top of the fortress, which could see what the Germans were doing. So in order to prevent the Belgians on the inside to know what was going on, they immediately took out most of the artillery observation posts and nearby observation posts on top of the fortress, rendering every, well, rendering the fortress blind, so to speak. So we've talked about this gigantic fortress, strategically enormously important. It was used to stop, or it was built to stop the Germans from invading Belgium. This fortress, fortress could take out uh, the three or four most important bridges across the Albert Canal, could fire on several locations, strategic locations, had an enormous uh, amount of artillery and was uh, without, if, if you walk around, this place is impenetrable. It makes, it makes the Death Star look like, I don't know, uh, an amusement park. But um, they said, okay, we've got tank ditches, we've got bunkers, we've got guns, we've got an entire mountain around us, we've got water on one end, we've got defenses, uh, we've got other fortresses that can cover our back. Nobody, nobody, nobody can ever, ever penetrate this fortress. But then what happened? Basically, they skipped all of our defensive lines and they landed right on top of the fortress where defense was actually pretty weak. We had two uh, machine gun bunkers, but unfortunately they were not completely manned due to administrative reasons. 
Now these Germans landed and um, so basically you had nine uh, gliders landing on top of the fortress. And this was the first time in, 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 in uh, actual war that an invasion was done using, using gliders. So the, basically the Germans crammed nine or eight soldiers in a glider and landed it on top of the fortress in the middle of the night. Now, if you will, we have some pictures of the outside. This is a gigantic terrain on top of it. But if you overshoot your mark, you're, you either end up in the trees and you're dead. You hit one of these bunkers and you're dead. Or you fall down uh, the cliff and into the canal and you're dead. And it's, it's especially at the edges, it's a pretty scary walk because you look down and it's really deep. And these guys, uh, this, the German army actually landed on top of here in the middle of the night. Uh, in between all of these gunning turrets on the top of the fortress where nobody had expected them. True, and many of the German pilots actually were, well, A-grade um, pilots, uh, as if. There were some uh, were actually European champion, German champion glider plane uh, flying. So we have, we're talking about really the best of the German army. In fact, the, the guys who attacked the fortress of Ebenemal and the bridges were trained for six months uh, separately in, well, very cruel conditions. Um, with only one goal uh, in front of their eyes, which was to attack a fortress and a bridge. Now I say a fortress and a bridge because none of them, apart from approximately five uh, out of the 400 uh, for the attack, were actually knowing which fortress they were going to attack, which bridges they were going to attack, in what country. They were left completely in the dark, of, uh, of course, uh, for secrecy reasons. So they came, uh, how many Germans did actually participate on the attack of the fortress and how many were in the fortress at the time of the attack? How many Belgian army uh, was, was present at the time? So in uh, regular conditions, the Germans would bring 86 German soldiers in 11 glider planes. While on the other hand, we have the Belgian army who had 1,200 Belgian soldiers right here at the fortress of Eben Emal. Now, not all 1,200 were here at the moment of landing. You can take, give or take, about 800 soldiers who were uh, on the inside of the fortress when the Germans landed. So 68 Germans scared the living daylights out of 800 Belgians and took the fortress in two days. Well, basically, that's, that's one way to put it. Uh, however, on the other way, you, you just described this casemate we are standing in right now, and we have no vision towards the outside. So, for all I know, there could be a German soldier with a hand grenade or with a shaved charge standing right next to the outside of this bunker, and we not know about it. So, and you'd, you'd be basically leaning against the wall that was about to blow up. You have no idea. Correct. Uh, from what I gathered from reports is that the Belgian soldiers heard the anti-aircraft gunners open fire and then it went silent and right two minutes afterwards they heard massive explosions uh, from these shaped charges. But at the time uh, the Belgian soldiers did not know what these charges were. So they were completely surprised by this German attack. So we're going back to the day of the attack. The Germans have just landed uh, 86 of their elite troops on top of the um, fortress, which was not mined, which was actually used for football, uh, soccer? Correct. Okay, most important fortress in the world, impenetrable, massive guns, topside, two soccer planes. And that's how the Germans knew that the area wasn't mined, because if the area would have been mined, they wouldn't have been able to land. That's true. It's actually the, the football pitch which, well... This. Tilted the wall. Yeah, you could say that. And it was an indication for the Germans that the fortress was really flat, that there indeed were no obstacles and, more importantly, no mines. So you had an, an ideal landing place, in this case for glider planes, which obviously don't have uh, engines revving. So therefore, completely silent, silent, ideal for an aerial surprise attack, which obviously, as you already stated, was the first ever attack uh, glider-borne attack in history. So basically, we had a lot of sad honors, one being the honor for uh, being attacked for the very first time with glider planes and the use of a shaped charge. This was also where it started. Now today, a shaped charge is commonly used in armor-piercing rounds, etc., etc., even used in, in uh, demolishing businesses for large uh, constructions. But back in, in the 1940s, this weapon was new. This was the first time ever it was used against a military target. So, so we're, we're placing the shape charge on top of each of these uh, bunkers are 
small but very thick iron domes which were used for observation and somebody would actually stand inside them and look out, report to the command room and they would again signal the firing rooms where to go. And uh, the Germans used this, this very new piece of technology which they really let work for them. Um, and it's a, 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 cha a shaped or a hollow charge. Now, what's the different b difference between a, a shaped charge and a hollow charge, uh, between a hollow charge and a regular charge, and how come it was so incredibly devastating? Well, basically the name speaks for itself. We have a hollow or a shaped charge. So there's actually a shape uh, right uh, at the center, at the bottom center of one of those charges. So, so basically it, the charge itself looks like a, 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 a half a dome. Yeah. It's, it's half a dome with at the center at the bottom you have this gap and it's some physics law that when an explosion occurs then uh, the pressure will actually search for the weakest point in this case being this small gap. It actually uh, confines all the pressure and then approximately 90% of the explosion power will go straight through in the direction of this, of this hollow point. Now if you compare it to a regular explosive, there the pressure will go pretty much every possible way because there is pretty much no resistance. But for a shaped charge, the pressure really is concentrated to one point. And I will show you some examples and you can take some pictures later on uh, showing you where this 90% actually impacted on the different bunkers and gun turrets. And you'll clearly see the difference so so uh, if I'm gonna make the the, the geeky the geeky um, analysis if we take a look at Armageddon uh, Bruce Willis very commonly explains if you take a firecracker and you put it on your hand uh, well basically you'll ha you'll burn your hand uh, if you uh, keep your hand open but this was actually closing your fist put your putting a firecracker inside leaving a small gap next to your thumb looking into that and then having the whole thing go off on you except for the fact that your hand will not explode, but the entire charge will go through this, this very little hole. How did they attach these? Glue? No, they weren't actually attached by any glue. We had a 50 kilo shaped charge, which was heavy enough, which was placed right on top of the domes, of the observation domes and the gun turrets. And they had a smaller version, the 12 and a half kilo version, which they actually just placed right against the, um, the iron, or at least the iron, the reinforced metal uh, parts, which seal off the front end of a casemate. So they just actually placed it loosely against uh, against these plates. Some people say, well, due to the pressure, they should be uh, shot thrown, by, back. thrown back. But this is not the case. The force and the heat is so intense that everything in front of the shape charge just literally melts. Uh, and the pressure wave for a 50 kilo shape charge was around 200,000 bar pressure. It just shoots through everything. On May 7, 1940, the impossible happened. The invincible fortress of Ebene Mal was attacked by German forces. A brilliantly planned and executed attack crippled the massive complex in under 48 hours. Instead of a conventional land-based attack, the German troops landed in glider planes on top of the fortress. Using hollow charge explosives, they disabled the observation posts on top of the bunkers, rendering the fortress blind and unable to fire. Going against orders, a couple of German soldiers attacked the bunker of Maastricht 1 and, by using another hollow charge, gained entrance to the bunker's interior, killing and wounding the Belgian soldiers inside. Boldly, they ventured down the 10-story stairwell connecting the gun emplacement to the lower level of the fortress, only to be stopped by a giant steel door. Overconfident, they used another hollow charge to blow the door open and gain entrance to the interior of the fortress. But the massive explosion that followed destroyed not only the door, but also the staircase, cutting off the Germans' only way in. Although their plan had backfired on the Germans, the resulting explosion unleashed their most powerful weapon inside the fortress. Total panic. underneath the Kazamat Maastricht 1 
um, 11 meters uh, above the medical facility of the fortress of Ibn Imal, near the entrance and exit, or main entrance and main exit. Uh, in front of me is a large, gigantically large uh, construct, a uh, steel door. Uh, we have uh, two steel doors which are very close to each other, gigantic steel doors. And when you look at one of the doors, they are closed. There are sandbags in between the two doors to keep the enemy out. But when we look at the other end, the concrete is cracked and twisted. And you see holes in the concrete everywhere from debris and shards flying out. Bart, what happened here? Well, as you said, we are at the bottom of Casemate Maastricht 1. And we are actually near the very end of the uh, attack, near German attack. On the 11th of May, around 8 a.m., um, the Germans placed a 50 kilo shaped charge right here at the bottom half of the stairwell uh, of the Maastricht 1, causing uh, the enormous destruction you, uh, you just described. Now, why did they do this? Well, basically to terrify the Belgian soldiers on the inside, because since the moment uh, they landed, the Belgian soldiers on the inside were actually unaware of how many troops were attacking them, uh, where exactly these troops were, etc., etc. And suddenly, uh, this uh, enormous explosion happens right here at the intermediate level of the fortress, uh, resulting in several uh, bad things. First of all, we have four defenders who were placed inside the gallery who were killed uh, on, in on impact by this explosion. Then, as you said, we're exactly 11 meters uh, above the medical facility of the fortress. And if you take a look at the timeline of the fortress, the soldiers who were in there at the medical facility at the time of this explosion, those were actually survivors of the first impact waves from the first attack uh, the Germans did on the fortress. So when they felt this explosion of this magnitude, this size, this power, uh, they were actually terrified and they figured, well, this is it, the Germans are on the inside. And to make things even worse, well, I don't know if you heard about uh, Murphy, the law of Murphy, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Well, basically, Murphy visited this place a lot. Uh, to give you an idea, to clean the toilets uh, in the upper levels of the casemates, some of the bunkers in general. Uh, casemates are, are gunnery emplacements, yeah. gunnery bunkers. Indeed, gunnery bunkers. Uh, we had barrels filled with chlorine powder stored right here at the bottom, so on the intermediate level to, uh, well, reduce the smell uh, of the toilets. Now, unfortunately, with this explosion, pretty much every barrel within, let's say, a 200 meter radius cracked and rolled over. Now, chlorine powder, when evaporated or when uh, blown through these galleries, gives a very unpleasant smell, and a lot of soldiers were actually afraid that the Germans used poisonous gases to attack the fortress, which, in a fortress's case, is your worst enemy. So you're, you're basically in a confined, airtight, underground uh, complex and suddenly you feel or you, uh, you smell chlorine gas coming through the air. And this was in the aftermath of 1914-18, the First World War, where the Germans did use mustard gas and used gas to uh, fight their enemies. Now, you've already described what the entrance to the bunker looks like. However, it is a nice opening, but the Germans never ever went to the inside of the fortress through here. The reason for that is, uh, well, very clearly, and I will show it to you just in a second. Okay. We are, we've gone a little bit further into the um, bunker underneath the casemate we just described where the Germans blew the doors out, ruptured, ruptured all the chlorine uh, containers and basically scared the living daylights out of the Belgian army that was inside the fortress at the moment. I'm looking up approximately 15 meters um, at a giant collapsed iron construction, a stairwell, it, uh, it must have been a stairwell of some kind. It is twisted, corroded, uh, crumpled like paper. Is that also uh, what happened after the explosion that was set off here? Yes, indeed. Now, the Germans placed a 50 kilo shape charge right at the doors, so not directly against the, uh, the, um, stairwell. the stairwell and the ammunition elevators. 
And basically what a shape charge does, as I explained before, 90% uh, pressure actually goes right through the middle of the shape charge, goes one direction, leaving approximately 10% coming back. And it is actually the 10% back pressure, if I can put it like that, that actually caused the destruction of this uh, stairwell. Now the first 50 meters or so are completely destroyed, uh, as seen in the picture. However, uh, when you go up a bit, it's okay. It's passable, but it's, as you can see, pretty destroyed over here. So this is only 10% of what a shape charge actually can do. So 90% basically went straight through that door. And if I take a look at the distance from the door to the wall of the corridor, we're talking about, I don't know, four meters or something. And uh, that 90% of the explosion uh, actually went straight into the fortress. Yeah, that's correct. Taking uh, also 30 steel beams as a barrage, uh, a number of sandbags and an additional armored door. It was crushed against the back wall, but because there is meters and meters of um, limestone, sandstone behind it, the pressure cannot go anywhere but directly into the corridors of the fortress, resulting in numerous casualties uh, on Belgian side as well. So it's, it's, if, if you can, can compare it, it's like taking a straw and blowing on it, because one, one of these corridors is basically a, a giant airtight straw in which the, uh, the, the resulting pressure, sound, smoke, smells, uh, chlorine, powder, uh, you, what have you, is basically blown through, turning them into giant exhaust pipes. Yeah, true. And you must not forget that if you are, let's say, in the extreme north part of the fortress on the inside, with this explosion, you could actually feel or hear the explosion to that point. But the problem is, since you're that far away, you have absolutely no idea where exactly this explosion happened. So when you need to get back to the underground barracks, you're like, OK, I can go left, I can go right. The explosion came from somewhere over here. But yeah, you cannot be really sure uh, as to where exactly this explosion happened, which, of course, was not very good for the morale of the Belgian soldiers on the inside. It's like basically hearing shots fired but not knowing which direction they came from, thus you don't know which, which direction to run. Yeah, indeed. And must not forget that uh, from the moment of the landing, the Belgians on the inside actually immediately shouted that the Germans were on the inside, which, as I explained, uh, is basically impossible. The Germans never ever were on the intermediate level during the attack. However, the rumor was spread. So again, this didn't help the Belgian soldiers at all. Just after the Germans hit the top of the fortress, they've just landed and panic is starting to ensue uh, inside the fortress. This is one of the key points where that happened, where the German uh, army actually scared the living daylights out of the Belgians here in the fortress. What, what happened here? Well, basically when the Germans landed, each and every one of those gliders had a small team of, let's say, eight uh, soldiers. They were uh, responsible for attacking one goal, their primary goal, and I want to talk to you about uh, the primary goal, Machine Gun Bunker North. This was attacked by uh, Sergeant Wenzel, uh, the German Sergeant Wenzel. And when he attacked this bunker, the bunker was completely destroyed. He went in using uh, a searchlight or at least a flashlight. And um, what he saw was, well, pitch black, a lot of smoke, a lot of dust. He saw some Belgian casualties who were on the inside of the bunker at the time of the explosion. And then all of a sudden he hears the telephone go off. Now this telephone was actually a man uh, on the command center over here uh, at one of the fire control rooms who was trying to communicate with the nearby observation post which was actually on top of that uh, specific bunker. So what happens is that this German Sergeant Wenzel, Wenzel, he picks up the phone and he hears a nervous French speaking voice. Now, Wenzel doesn't understand French as well, so he just lets the man talk and when this man takes a small pause, he actually replies in English with a pretty bad German accent, here are the Germans. And that's when he hears three more French words which he does understand, oh mon dieu, or in English, oh my god. Now, you must understand the following. Up until the very eve of World War II for Belgium, this fortress was deemed impregnable and it was said to all of the soldiers, well, don't worry, you're 50 meters below surface, nothing can harm you right over here. 
Then, without warning, there are Germans landing on top of the fortress on a way that the Belgians held, well, pretty much impossible. And then when you pick up the telephone and call to one of your own defensive bunkers of the fortress, you get the enemy directly at the other end of the line. That's, uh, needlessly to say, a very bad sign. So that's basically how panic started, because right after that phone communication, the Belgians uh, shouted throughout the entire fortress, the Germans are on the inside. But of course, what is the inside? I mean, we have galleries up to five and a half kilometers in length, well, define inside. Because they, they, they were basically had, had gained entrance to one of the gunning turrets up top, which were still shielded from the galleries, and the galleries have doors, so inside is a very relative um, uh, term. But basically picking up the phone to call one of your own and having your enemy at the other end saying, hello and how are you, is, uh, is uh, of course one of the reasons uh, to, to panic. Yeah, true. So again, to give you... Uh, just to, um, to give you an idea, when this fortress was on a regular attack, at least that's how they uh, foreseen it, then to give you an idea, the Germans had to cross the southern Netherlands, they had to cross uh, several bridges across the Maas River, then they crossed the Belgian-Dutch border, then we had the Albert Canal, hopefully we had destroyed the bridges right in time. Even if they managed to cross the Albert Canal, then we had the Belgian Field Army. If the Germans managed to uh, go past the Belgian Field Army, then, we would actually, uh, then they would actually encounter the Belgian defense defensive bunkers of the fortress around the fortress and when they and only when they managed to pass those then were they on top of the fortress so the belgians figured this would take days for the germans to get on top of the fortress unfortunately the first place where the germans uh, touched ground so to speak was right on top of the fortress so basically right in our back door So we're back at one of the gigantic doors underneath one of the casemates where um, the explosion occurred and where while panic was ensuing inside the fortress, you must think of it, uh, it's uh, electricity is failing, it's pitch black, there are explosions everywhere, you don't know where they're coming from. Your supreme or your, your commanding officer has just been uh, on the phone with the enemy basically saying uh, that the Germans are here. Uh, there is total, total panic. What happened next? Well, after a while, um, the fortress decided to surrender. First of all, because we had a lot of casualties. Uh, we had 24 Belgian soldiers who lost their lives, which for a fortress is, is quite traumatic, actually. And uh, well, after a while, we had pretty much no artillery left firing towards the bridges. So yes, we could still fight on, but what's the purpose? We but the enemy wasn't at the bridges. The enemy was, was right on top of you. Well, the enemy was right on top of us, true, but the enemy actually landed simultaneously. When they landed on the fortress, they also simultaneously landed glider planes at the bridges of Kahn, Vroenhoven and Veldwezelt. Uh, now, we were unaware pretty much of the, um, of, um, the, the destiny of those bridges, apart from the bridge from Kahn, which we destroyed. Um, but the other two, we had no clue what was happening. So, we could still fight on, but we, but our artillery uh, was destroyed to fire upon those bridges. So, fighting on was pretty much useless, actually. Um, when the fortress eventually uh, surrendered, the Belgian soldiers went uh, into captivity for uh, some over five years, and a couple of them uh, really were released after a couple of months. So, depended a bit. So the Germans actually took, the, the fort surrendered to the German army, basically the, the, the soldiers walked out with, with white flags on top of their head because they couldn't fire uh, at the bridges anymore, they didn't know what was uh, still up and down, uh, they were surrounded by, uh, by German forces, but what did all of this mean? What did the fall of this enormous fortress in, I think, 23 hours or two days or something, what did it actually mean for, for Belgium in the Second World War and what did it mean uh, for the rest of Europe? Well, the problem was, as I told you, the fortress had to, uh, well, fight for five days. That was the ideal uh, plan. But because the fortress fell so quickly, approximately 90,000 German troops crossed the bridges of Frunhoven and Veldwezelt in the first 24 hours after their capture. So we're talking a massive, massive invasion. 90,000 people, 90,000 soldiers pouring into Belgium. 
True, this was really the spear point of the German attack. In fact, the Germans landed five minutes prior from crossing the borders uh, at Dutch, at, between Germany and uh, the Netherlands. So this was really the spear point to secure the bridges, to hold them and wait for the German field army to arrive. Now, because this fortress had to surrender so quickly, the French and the British troops who were supposed to come Belgium uh, into a Belgian countryside and dig in were, uh, well, they were attacked quicker than uh, expected and of course that didn't uh, do much uh, well as uh, well, that wasn't uh, as pretty as well. In fact, this was in global history, uh, this was really a diverse attack. The main German attack went through the Ardennes, uh, but because they uh, issued such a big attack on Eben Emal and this region uh, specifically, the, Bel the French, the Belgian and the British army figured that the main attack would be right over here. So they sent all their troops in this direction, while at the same time the Germans used like a, uh, well, a move, a pincer move uh, through the Ardennes which was a region, uh, ironically speaking, where pretty much all of the Allied governments figured that that would be impenetrable for armored vehicles, which the Germans quickly uh, said, well, that's possible. And as a result of that, the, the Allied forces had to retreat faster than expected, uh, resulting in the enormous shipping of, of people, personnel, military personnel, soldiers, tanks, uh, literally uh, from the uh, mainland to England in Dunkirk, uh, not uh, that much later. But this was basically the place where World War II really started. The Germans invaded, uh, went through the Netherlands, came across the Belgian border in one movement. Holland wasn't occupied at that time. Well, uh, the Netherlands had only one uh, minor infantry unit here in the southern Netherlands, so basically you could say that it was pretty much undefended. The, the German army was just way bigger, had way bigger uh, or way better equipment than both the Netherlands and the Belgian army. So yeah, their attack or the seizing of those bridges was key to their victory, to their blitzkrieg right here in the Western, uh, your Western Europe. We have the, the pleasure and the honor of having our own personal guide and touring this enormous complex alone uh, with just the three of us. But this is actually a site that people can visit. Yeah, we have uh, regular and regular intervals. We have public visit days, um, which mean that uh, during the weekend you have people coming in from 10 a.m. up until uh, 4, a, 4 p.m. And they can visit this place uh, with the guides, such as I. Um, and then they have a general impression of what the inside of the fortress looks like. And well, for the dates, I would uh, advise you to consult the website of the fortress. Uh, it will be somewhere near the comment section uh, of, um, of this podcast. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Bart, for this very, very impressive tour of this uh, wonderful facility, which is 70 years after its original building and now coming up to, to May uh, 2010. 50 years? 70 years? Uh, on, the, on the money, 70 years after it was first attacked. Are you planning anything special? Is the, is the uh, fortress open at that time? Well, it's not open on May 10th, 1940. However, for those interested and for those nearby, uh, on the public visit weekend of May, which is, I believe, May 16th and 17th of May, or 15th and 16th of May, uh, we have uh, on the outside of the fortress uh, a large spectacle. There are reenactment groups uh, going to reenact the entire uh, attack of the fortress. And yes, we have been given the authorization to use explosives. So, um, But the complete date will be mentioned uh, on the website of the fortress. So, uh, We'll link to that. Why, thank you, Bart. It's been an honor and it's been a great time having you on uh, the Nightcast here in the fortress of Eben Emal. We at Nightwise.com wish to thank the fortress of Eben Emal and especially our guide Bart Gerards for making this episode possible. Thanks to their time and support, we were able to bring you this exclusive tour in Belgium's largest underground fortress. You can visit the Fortress of Ibn Imal once a month and enjoy their guided tours yourself. 
The 70th anniversary celebrations are on the 15th and the 16th of May 2010. For more information, go to www.fortissimus.be, which is spelled www.fortissimus.be, or head over to the show notes for more information. Also pop over to nightwise.com to see the exclusive pictures we took inside and on top of the fortress, along with many informative links if you want to know more about the fortress of Ebene Mal. Your questions and feedback can be sent to the usual address, nightwise at nightwise.com, or via Twitter on twitter.com slash nightwise. Next time we'll be back on the edge of real and cyberspace and let technology work for you. Thanks for coming to the edge of real and cyberspace. You have been listening to the Nightcast. Send your feedback, questions, promos, or rants to nightwise at nightwise.com or Skype us on Nightwise. For more information, visit the site on www.nightwise.com or look for us in iTunes by searching for the Nightcast. Please remember, there's a real world beyond cyberspace, but it's not all that important. 